the talk of the Philosophy Sharing Foundation. Um, right, <clears throat> the philosophy of emotions. Now, the topic for those who have studied philosophy uh, might seem a bit strange because, as you probably know, at least those who have studied philosophy, emotions have never been the object of philosophy, or rather, philosophy have always looked at emotions with suspicion. Because, obviously, as you know, emotions are considered either non-rational, sometimes they are see, sort, um, seen as a-rational, that is, neither rational nor non-rational, and some have gone perhaps to the other extreme of seeing um, emotions as exactly the opposite of reason, which is obviously the hallmark of any philosophical enterprise. Now, this antagonism between philosophy, or rather between reason on the one hand, because philosophy is the study of reason, eh? is the study of how the human being engages in reasoning, in cognitive processes. And so this antagonism between reason and emotions has a very long past. In fact, we can trace it back to the classical period. We can mention already a very important figure in this respect, namely Plato. Plato saw emotions as dangerous because emotions obviously make us take decisions on the spur of the moment. It does not allow us to think, to engage in cognitive processes, which is what human beings should do, because we are rational animals. This is how Aristotle defined man. Man is a rational animal. So, removing abdicating to our rational nature for Plato was the gravest of sins, of philosophical sins, obviously, in a sense. So, the idea of speaking about philosophy of emotions might seem quite a surprise. And there are obviously a number of reasons for this interest, philosophical interest in emotions. Basically, you can list four main reasons. There are others, but I think we can <coughs> uh, mention the most important reasons. The first reason why philosophy has been showing a new interest in emotions is the fact that philosophy is more than ever before engaged in what we can call dialogue with other sciences. Interdisciplinarity, as you know, has become the hallmark of any scientific research, of any scientific endeavor. And that obviously includes also philosophy. Philosophy is aware of the new sciences which have developed in the 19th and the 20th centuries, and obviously it cannot remain aloof from the progress which is being registered in these sciences. And one of the most important areas of science, which um, has been doing a lot of progress, is what we usually call cognitive science. Cognitive science is a very wide term. It is an umbrella term, as we say, which encloses and which includes many sciences. It includes philosophy. It includes psychology. Psychology, we have developmental psychology. We have evolutionary psychology, to mention two very important areas which deal with um, cognitive science. We can mention social psychology as well. Anthropology. Neuroscience, which is becoming very, very important and the links which neuroscience and neurosciences in general 
are establishing with philosophy, with psychology, with anthropology. So this new interest in what other disciplines are doing has taken out philosophy from its, as we call it, ivory tower, in which it had been uh, okay, placed for many centuries, to take an interest in what is going on in other sciences. And obviously this made philosophy come into contact with emotions throughout or through the various sciences which we have mentioned. For example, developmental psychology studies how human beings starting from neonates and almost even the prenatal period how emotions develop how these emotions are eventually expressed how these emotions change throughout the lifespan of the individual if we take evolutionary psychology another important branch of psychology we see how emotions have played according to evolutionary theory a very important and crucial role in the development of the very human species the fact that throughout our evolutionary history emotions have played and still play an important part and it is still with us we have emotions and we express emotions and this is throughout our evolutionary history goes to show the importance and the strength of these emotions in the development of the human species in this sense i have to mention without any shadow of doubt a very important figure in this respect i'm referring to charles darwin charles darwin who came out with the evolutionary theory in mid 19th century 1859 it coincided more or less with the publication of marx and engels the communist manifesto two very important works which obviously were going to influence society and even uh, studies in general um, especially not only through perhaps his most um, uh, well-known work um, the development the um, uh, evolution through natural selection and the um, the, the place of uh, adaptation but also the work which perhaps is more related to our topic namely the expression of emotions in man and animals and for example in this sense evolutionary theory has tried to see what we can call the pan-cultural expression of emotions we know that there are emotions which are worldwide i mean whether you go to asia whether you go to europe whether you go to africa the way we express happiness is the same the way we express surprise is the same the way we express fear is the same so there is this common element independent of culture and independent of geographical location in the way we express emotions and therefore this is why darwin in his um, also years which he had uh, spent <coughs> on the hms beagle which took him as you know to the galapagos islands where he had the occasion to study in great detail um, various animal species and also the way the behavior patterns of these animal species uh, were um, expressed and the emotions were expressed this gave rise obviously to an interest in uh, in emotions now <clears throat> anthropology for example would see the way in which emotions help us to establish uh, relationships here obviously we have to call in also social psychology how what role do emotions play in our social 
interrelationships in our also personal relationships. So, as you can see, this interest coming from various sciences towards emotions led philosophy to sort of think it twice before condemning, as it had done in the past, all studies or all reference to emotions. A second reason for this new interest uh, in emotions, always from the part of philosophy, uh, is the way in which philosophy began to understand the role of emotions even in our cognitive processes. For example, a very important notion, concept, which we already find in the classical period, is the concept of akrasia. Akrasia is the Greek word for weakness of will. Weakness of will. Which means that sometimes we tend, consciously, or perhaps even in part unconsciously, to act in a way which goes against our good judgment. And this is, in a way, shows how emotions come into decision-making. As you know, decision-making is a very important aspect which is being studied and which has been studied for in these last years by many sciences, including also philosophy, uh, which tries to see what are the causes, what leads a person to decide in one way and not in another, what are the immediate and perhaps not immediate factors, remote and proximate factors, which lead a person to make a certain decision. So, this idea of uh, deciding, this idea of judging, this idea of acting in a way which is not always in accordance with our good judgment, had already, um, had already been approached by classical philosophy because it had to be understood why does a person act in a way which goes against what he or she thinks should be done in a particular situation as also the other situation where we have a person uh, which gives in to certain desires even though knowing that perhaps those desires are not in accordance with his or her beliefs. So, this is another reason why philosophy began to take interest in emotions. A third reason for philosophy taking this interest in emotions regards what we usually refer to as ethics, philosophical ethics. As you know, ethics is the branch of philosophy which studies the concepts of good and evil, right and wrong, just and unjust. And obviously, ethics has a very long history in philosophy. We usually date the beginning of ethics as a formal study with we attribute the beginning of ethics uh, to Socrates. Socrates is considered to be the father of ethics and therefore ethics has a very long history in uh, philosophy and this idea of looking at emotions as forming parts of our moral judgments we are able to form and to make a moral judgment now what is the place what role does emotion play in such a decision in a moral decision Usually, we have been accustomed to look at certain schools of ethics. For example, just to mention two very important schools of ethics, we have the school of Kant, so we have Kantian ethics, or the ethics of duty, the ethics of obligation, and on the other hand, we have utilitarian ethics, the ethics of Jeremy Bentham, of Mill, the therefore British philosophers, who based their theory on utilitas. What is 
useful in a given situation by adapting and adopting and applying the principle to um, find the greatest happiness of the greatest number of persons possible. This is the utilitarian maxim, trying to create, trying to enhance the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people. Now, these two theories, just by way of example, show us how ethics has been, in a way, either um, seen and perceived according to what Kant said, or is according to what the utilitarians said. Now, other theories, obviously, had been proposed, both in the classical and even in the other periods, medieval and the modern. If we want to take some um, new, rather, or well, not so new, theories in ethics, in which emotion begins to have a very important part, we can mention the ethics of, for example, Elizabeth Anscombe, which emphasizes the idea of virtues in ethics, and the, um, uh, the, the British philosopher Alistair MacIntyre, who brings back the concept of virtues, which obviously, as you know, had already been described by Plato and especially by Aristotle in their works on ethics, especially in the works of Aristotle, the um, Nicomachean ethics and the Eudaimonian ethics, in which Aristotle puts a very <coughs> important emphasis, big emphasis, on the role of virtues in our ethical life. And also, as far as emotions are concerned, emotions play a part both in Plato, as I, will be seeing, as I will be saying, and in Aristotle, even though at times there are important differences <coughs> between the two philosophers, even though today uh, it seems that those differences are not as um, great as we used to think they are, through, obviously, um, revision uh, and revisiting the works of these two great philosophers. A fourth reason which we can adduce to the importance of emotions in philosophy is what we usually call philosophical aesthetics. Aesthetics, as you know, is the branch of philosophy which deals with what is beautiful, with beauty in general. Now, in aesthetics, emotions have a very important role to play, just Think about music, art, theatre, cinema, the visual arts, sculpture, painting, architecture, how emotions are, how many emotions are involved, both in the production of the work itself, the artist, the writer, the sculptor, the painter, the architect, obviously, when he or she was thinking was projecting that uh, painting, sculpture, whatever it was, obviously was influenced by his or her emotions in projecting the work and in the actual um, uh, delivery of the work. And also this can be seen from the end point of the person who is appreciating that work of art, the emotions which persons have when viewing a film, when seeing a beautiful painting, when uh, listening to good music. So uh, philosophical aesthetics began to look at emotion and emotions in general as very important to understand even a work of beauty, what beauty hmm, involves. Since, as we know, as John Keats, the famous English poet, says, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. So, obviously, okay, as we know, uh, many works of art which have been produced not only in 
in the Middle Ages or in the Renaissance, okay, have all attracted attention worldwide and notwithstanding time, the passing of time, such works remain um, beautiful and they attract people and they are therefore in a way immortalized, hmm? immortalized by the creator of that work of art. So these are some of the reasons which we find for this new interest of philosophy in emotions. Now, obviously the question now has to be put and possibly answered. What do we understand by emotions? What are emotions in the first place? We have been speaking about emotions, but as yet we have not defined what an emotion is. Now here obviously we have different terms which sometimes are used interchangeably but unfortunately they have the same they do not have the same meaning so we have to distinguish for example between an emotion a passion a mood there are three terms which we use many times interchangeably but actually they refer to different aspects I will be speaking obviously here principally on emotions but obviously we have also to mention both passions and moods uh, because these are related of course but obviously they refer to different aspects of our emotional life how can we define emotion and emotion principally two definitions of emotion have been given one by the famous American philosopher and psychologist William James, brother of the famous writer Henry James. James defined emotion as a bodily feeling or the perception of a bodily feeling. So for James, emotions primarily had to do with our bodily makeup. We are made up of a body and a soul, to use platonic um, terms. And for James, emotions mainly implicated the body. It is a bodily feeling or the perception of a bodily feeling. On the other side, we have the definition of Aristotle and the Stoics. For Aristotle and the Stoics, basically, an emotion is a cognitive, worldly, directed, intentional state. This is basically what Aristotle and the Stoics, who were influenced by Aristotle, have to say about emotions. They are cognitive, so for Aristotle, emotions are related to our cognitive aspect, to our cognitive uh, part of our being. Worldly directed, they are directed to the outside world, and here obviously we can refer to what we were saying uh, uh, some minutes ago um, with what Darwin said in his book, which I mentioned, the expression of emotions in man and animals, he says that emotions have played and do play a very important part in our evolutionary <coughs> history. Were it not for our emotions and were it not for the way we came to learn how to express these same emotions, perhaps our evolutionary history would have been very different from what it actually <coughs> was. Why? Because those emotions relate us to the outside world. Just think about the emotion of fear, the emotion of love, the emotion of hatred, just to mention three very strong emotions in the human being. Emotions which, according to Darwin, are also present in animals. And this is why he made this comparative study between how animals, especially primates, express their emotions 
and how the human being expresses emotions. He saw a very um, important link and similarity between how primates and the human species express their emotions. So when Aristotle defined emotion as a cognitive, worldly directed, intentional state, he was taking into consideration the way we are actually related to the world. And as you know, Aristotle was the philosopher who wholeheartedly accepted the world in which we live as against Plato, who, as you know, disdained this world to the extent that he had to come up with this world of forms, the world of pure forms or pure ideas, which Aristotle simply rejected. Aristotle obviously remained um, uh, very, um, was very respectful of his master, Plato, but as uh, those who study philosophy know, uh, Aristotle simply disagreed with many of the philosophical tenets of Plato, chief amongst which was precisely the idea of this ideal world. For Aristotle, the world in which we live is our world. Full stop. Okay? There is no need to postulate another world in which, according to Plato, things are in perfection, they are in their perfect state, because for Plato, our world is a world of imperfection, okay, and so, so he postulates this idea world. For Aristotle, no, this is the world in which we live, and this is where we have to live our life, and therefore we have to establish relationships, not only with other human beings, but also with the outside, with the external world. So, the two definitions of emotion, as you can see, are, in a way, opposites. For James, emotions have to relate and do relate to our bodily aspect. For Plato and the Stoics, emotions have to do with our cognitive aspect. In one sense, both were correct, so there is no need to take these two theories or two definitions of emotions as antagonistic they are rather complementary, and as a recent theory is showing, um, in fact, the two theories complement very much each other because emotions not only affect our bodily states, but they affect also our cognitive and our, if you want, psychological states. And I think the concept of psychosomatic conditions or psychosomatic illnesses uh, goes to show how much this theory um, holds water. That is, emotions do not only affect our bodily states. When we have an emotion, as you know, our physiology is affected. Hmm? Our breathing um, changes. Our heart rate increases. Blood pressure increases okay, when we are passing through a very strong emotion like fear or love. Okay? So there is the bodily aspect, but there is also the cognitive aspect. How much does emotion come into then our decision making? And one influences the other. The bodily influences the psychic and the cognitive, the psychic and the cognitive influence the body. And therefore, there is this uh, idea of complementarity between the two uh, theories which have been proposed um, in, therefore, the history of philosophy. Now, what about the history of emotions in the history of philosophy? Because, perhaps, I hope I have not given you the idea that emotions have never been considered in philosophy. They have been considered. I mentioned Plato and Aristotle. Plato had a negative idea about emotions. In his tripartite theory of the soul, Plato had suggested that the rational, the human soul, is made up of three parts. The rational, 
part, the spirited part, and the instinctive or the primitive part. And uh, for Aristotle, only the rational part is immortal, while the spirited and the, um, the primitive part are mortal. That is, they do not survive death. Only the rational part of the soul survives death. And when Plato speaks about the spirited part, he is basically speaking about emotions. In fact, he puts the rational part in the head, obviously where the brain is, because it is through the brain that we do all the decisions or the cognitive processes which we are capable of doing. In the spirited part, which he places in the midriff, in the breast, okay, because there is the heart, and the heart uh, in the classical times was not only the seat of wisdom and the seat of judgment, but it was also the seat of emotions. In fact, we still use the heart as a symbol of love, as a symbol of emotions. So, in the spirited part, Plato gathers more or less what we today would call our emotions. Emotions which, for Plato, however, were dangerous. Dangerous because, according to Plato, the emotions are very fickle. The emotions are short-lived. The emotions usually make us decide on the spur of the moment without considering the consequences of our actions. So they might lead us to do things which perhaps later on we would be, we would regret taking such decisions. Why? Because those decisions did not come as a result of a reasoning process, but they came as a result of something which we acted upon at, uh, on the spur of the moment, on that particular moment, without thinking about the consequences. While for Aristotle, as I said, the idea of emotions come up even in how he describes the moral life in his works on ethics, both in the Nicomachean and the Eudaimonian ethics, Aristotle emphasizes the fact that our moral life is not a question of actions which are sp sporadic, but they are actions which have to be done on a regular basis. And in fact, he speaks about the idea of habit, habitus, that is something which you make on a regular basis. I cannot be called a patient man just because once in a blue moon I show patience okay, um, in some <coughs> circumstance which requires patience from me. Being patient once okay, uh, in a blue moon does not make me a patient man. Just the same with prudence, for example, with justice, with temperance, with fortitude or courage, or as we call them, the four moral virtues. Okay, So, for Aristotle, the ethical life is a question of habit. It's a question of repeating those actions so that you can acquire those virtues and therefore you can truly be called a patient man or a prudent man or a just man or a temperate man or person. Emotions have a role to play, even in our ethical life, and this is therefore how Aristotle looks at emotions. They are important because they help us to not only practice the virtues, but to practice the virtues on a regular basis. So, the two ideas, that of Plato on the one hand and that of Aristotle on the other hand, and the Stoics, were going to lead the way throughout the history of philosophy. There were those philosophers who agreed with Plato, there were obviously other philosophers who agreed with Aristotle and the Stoics. If 
we look at the medieval period, okay, I'm just obviously giving a very um, brief uh, account of the way in which the emotions have been treated by philosophers in, therefore, the history of philosophy. If we take Augustine, for example, who, as you know, is considered to be the father of medieval philosophy, in Augustine we see a shift of emphasis. Augustine was influenced by Neoplatonism, as you might know, which was a new way of looking at philosophy, at the Platonic philosophy, mainly at its mystical aspects rather than its rational aspects, and Augustine is credited with being almost the first philosopher in the history of Western philosophy to give importance to the concept of will. The concept of will, will as one of the faculties which the human <coughs> being is endowed with, had in a way almost been put aside, both by Plato and even to a certain extent by Aristotle. With Augustine we have this um, new interest in the will, which had been neglected, as I'm saying, in Western philosophy, and in this respect he gives importance to the role of emotions in the, um, in the, in the way the human being lives his life. It's, um, you, you have to read, for example, the famous Confessions, perhaps the, the book which is most usually attribute, um, uh, attributed to um, Augustine, um, to see how Augustine gives importance to emotions, huh? especially the emotion of love, the emotion of fear also. These emotions are mentioned in the Confessions and the way in which these emotions influence our life. Augustine therefore paved the way for the way in which the emotions had to be then studied by later philosophers. For example, we can mention Anselm and Peter Lombard in the Middle Ages, in the 13th, 12th centuries, to see the influence of Augustine on their uh, way of dealing with emotions. Aquinas, for example, in the 13th century, will obviously make reference to Aristotle, because, as we know, Aquinas, in a way, baptized Aristotle, or Christianized Aristotle, and he used Aristotle's philosophy to elaborate, then, his theological um, masterpiece in the Summa Theologiae, and therefore Aquinas also saw the importance of virtues which Aristotle had mentioned, and the way in which emotions therefore have a role in our life. However, these theories eventually will be rejected by the modern philosophers after the Renaissance, uh, as you know, there was a very strong rejection on the part of um, modern philosophers, both the empiricists, the British empiricists, and the continental rationalists, to those theories which had been developed in the Middle Ages. However, this does not mean that the concept of emotion and the interest in, in emotion um, disappeared. Um, exactly the contrary took place. If we mention a very important um, philosopher like David Hume, for example, the uh, Scottish philosopher, we see how important emotions uh, have in his philosophy. He says that emotions are what, in a way, define the human being. Through emotions, we can show um, our um, our ourselves, we express ourselves through emotions, and we can also um, convey important um, ideas through emotions. Um, if we come, so that I cut a long story short, if we come to our modern period, for example, if we mention Heidegger, 
Martin Heidegger, the phenomenologist, the German philosopher, uh, we see that emotions also play an important part uh, in his philosophy. In Heidegger's philosophy, emotions are, as Aristotle had said, worldly oriented, with the difference that for Heidegger, emotions are perceptual, worldly related. So, as a phenomenologist, obviously, Heidegger placed emphasis on what appears. Hmm? This is what, after all, phenomenology means, phenomena what appears, what can be seen. And therefore, for Heidegger, emotions, yes, are worldly oriented, but they are perceptually worldly oriented. So it is, okay, uh, the idea hmm, that we are in this world, hmm, the concept of Dasein, right? being, Sein und Zeit, being and time. We are, we have been thrown in time, and we cannot escape. I mean, neither time, nor space. We are enmeshed in time and space, and therefore emotions have a very important part to play in our relations with the external world. If we take up Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, the existentialist philosopher, again we find the appearance or the expression of emotions in the works of Sartre as being related to our existence. As you know, Sartre insisted on the idea of being, on the idea of existence, rather than on um, the idea of, um, of esse, uh, of being. Existence, we exist before we, we are, in a way. So, for Sartre, the emotions have this important aspect, and therefore we can find in emotions the strength also to express ourselves in a way which is uh, more human um, oriented. So this is just by way of uh, uh, showing you how emotions have been treated <coughs> in the history of philosophy. Now, um, how do we account for emotions, for example, in our personal life? Uh, so, the relationship between emotions and the self. And I think that uh, in this respect, um, uh, psychology has uh, dealt with this theme in a very uh, important and, I would say, even exhaustive way uh, to, the, to the extent that philosophy hmm, is obviously taking an interest in what psychological studies on emotions are telling us um, in, in this uh, day and age. So, what are the relations between emotions and the self? How can I define myself through the, expre through the expression of my emotions? When I express an emotion, how, what does that tell about me? So, obviously, we communicate, as we know, not only through language, which is the characteristic form of human communication, but we communicate also through body language. And body language, as you know, is very much intimately connected with emotions. Just take our facial expressions, for example, when we have the emotion of fear. Okay, I can tell, we can tell that a person is expressing fear through his or her facial expression, through his bodily gestures. Just as I can say that a person is expressing um, affection, love, tenderness through bodily expressions, through facial gestures. So what is the role of emotion in the expression of self? Not to, not to um, forget also the fact that human beings, because don't forget that it is not only human beings, but also animals which express emotions. And as we said before, this was what Darwin tried to show, the similarity of our emotions in animals and in the human beings. How can 
the fact that we can use language, the fact that we are conscious of these emotions, the fact that we can talk about these emotions, something which perhaps in the past was not so common, uh, contrary <clears throat> to what we perhaps today we have gone to the other extreme. We live in an age where emotions run supreme. What is important is expressing my emotions without any fear, without any okay, uh, conditions, uh, because that is how I feel in that particular moment. This is perhaps going now to the other extreme. But as you know, previously, uh, the expression of emotions was considered to be something which had to be controlled. You know that, for example, in Western society, um, but also in Eastern societies, to a certain extent, the expression of emotions in uh, males was considered something okay, to be a sign of weakness. If you cried, if a man cried, then he would show that he is not a man. He is not virile. Eh? His virility would, in a way, be diminished because he was not able to control this emotion. Today, obviously, we know that expressing your emotions is an important aspect of your well-being, of your psychological and psychic well-being. So, we have, in a way, run through the different stages and the different phases of the expression of our emotions. So, being able to talk about our emotions, and this is something, for example, which is uh, made uh, in counseling, in psychotherapy, the client is helped to express his emotions. In psychoanalysis, for example, Freud saw the importance of leading his client or patient to express emotions because, according to Freud, that was important so that the liberation of the, um, of the uh, unconscious hmm, could be achieved. And in fact, this is for Freud, this was for Freud, a method of catharsis, a method of purification. You would be able to purify yourself by going through those traumatic experiences which have uh, um, left their indelible mark in your unconscious so that you can finally achieve freedom, liberation, once you relive those traumatic experiences. Obviously, with all the emotional um, aspects which such a process of purification of catharsis um, has with it. So, as you can see, the idea of emotions, the, the role of emotions in our life has become more focused upon. And philosophy, therefore, from this aspect, is taking cognizance of this aspect, of this important um, um, achievement in the um, cognitive sciences, and therefore this new interest is leading philosophy to pay more attention and to rethink, to make an important rethinking of what uh, it has said throughout the different ages on this topic of emotions. Emotions are not something to be antagonized to reason, but they should be seen as something which complement reason. And this complementarity will help us to understand more fully the human being. So, the definition of man as a rational being stands, but it has to be qualified. Rationality and emotionality define the human person. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. You have been very gender neutral. Um, what is, wouldn't it be the case that throughout the history of philosophy, reason was something characteristic of men and emotions of women? And when you talk about 
um, reason being superior to emotions, it was the same thing. Man superior uh, to women. Uh, and all, all the implications. Now, at the end, he talked about complementarity. Um, and, and, and I was thinking about marriage, in fact, because if reason marries emotions, there is a sort of complementarity. But there is a social a social pattern how that should work, isn't there? Even legal. So, I mean, you are very neutral, but, but I don't think the history of philosophy is that neutral. Aristotle and Plato were very much against, or not very friendly towards women, and so were so yes. many other philosophers. <clears throat> what yes, I think that social factor has to be taken into consideration, obviously, because philosophy, as uh, we all know, does not fall from having ready-made. It is the product of a given era, of a given historical epoch, of persons who obviously were influenced by the social, the political, the historical, the religious environments, and their product, their philosophical writings, are actually uh, um, a product of that particular um, um, environment of that particular historical epoch. So, yes, I would agree with you that, uh, in a sense, um, philosophy, uh, even if we think about philosophers, who were the women philosophers in the classical period? I can mention perhaps one, Apathia, okay, who was uh, Greek. Uh, but all the philosophers were male. We have to wait till the modern ages, uh, perhaps even later, to have uh, women philosophers. So that is already, I think, uh, an expression of what you were saying, that uh, philosophy, in a way, has always been uh, related mm, to the male figure. So the fact that males were writing philosophy is already something which uh, gave a certain uh, vista uh, of philosophy. Okay? Uh, if we read the works of women philosophers, Hannah Arendt, Anscombe, uh, and others, I think, obviously, there we would perhaps try to have uh, a new way of uh, studying, of uh, understanding philosophy, which is from a woman's perspective. I mean, uh, this is, I think, something which... Uh, which does not mean putting emotions before reason. No, but I think the fact that uh, a woman uh, who sees things differently, uh, we have uh, many female um, philosophers. philosophers here, or budding <laughs> philosophers, so I mean, you can, uh, I, I think, uh, express your views on, on the subject, okay? Uh, I don't know what you thought, those who first studied philosophy, when studying philosophy, okay? Uh, just a long list of myths, okay? Starting from Thales, okay, of Miletus, coming down to the contemporary period. It is, as I said, in the contemporary period, or late modern period, that we begin to have women philosophers. So, I think that is already a conditioning factor which, obviously, as you are saying, put reason as superior to emotions. So, when we have philosophers, male philosophers, like David Hume, whom I mentioned, speaking, and Augustine, as I said, speaking about emotions and the importance of emotions, I think they, they were the exceptions to the rule. And so, it is important to see what they wrote and what they thought was important even, obviously they were not writing just for women in this case, they were writing, I mean, for probably only males, because again, I mean, certain subjects were, okay, the um, uh, monopoly of, okay, who studied philosophy in the Middle Ages, okay, and in the classical period, <coughs> only male, male students. Right. So, I think this historical condition is important to take into consideration. Now, 
the fact that reason was seen as superior to emotions obviously again is linked to experiences I mentioned Plato why did Plato um, take such a negative aspect at emotions obviously because of his personal experience with the fate F -A -T -E, of Socrates Socrates was condemned okay, uh, during the period when Greece, when Athens was under a democratic government, okay, and when people simply decided that Socrates was um, culpable because they were not deciding on their reason, but they were deciding on their emotions, and therefore this is why Plato sees the emotions as fickle, they change and effeminate. In that's a way, the, that's the, always the problem. In a way. But, but the jury, the 500 men jury, was made of 500 males, <coughs> not females. So even males have emotions, even if perhaps they did not. They were not ready to accept or to admit that they had emotions. But for Plato, the, um, uh, con the, the condemnation of Socrates came because those persons, those maids who formed the 500 jury, the 500 jury, simply did not follow their rational dictates, but they followed their emotions. We have just uh, come out from the Holy Week. Uh, on Palm Sunday, people were calling Hosanna. On Good Friday, they were calling Crucify. If that is not an example of emotional fickleness, I don't know what can be expressed as emotional fickleness. Many times, perhaps we would not admit it. We, we, I, I speak as a male in this case. <coughs> Perhaps we are not ready to admit that we huh, act on our emotions. It seems to be non viral to say, I acted on my emotions. I have to defend my rationality. But deep down, I know that many times I act on my emotions. And I think this is something which uh, we all experience. How many times? Huh? The media, for example, how, how does the media play on our emotions? That is something which we have to tackle. Right? How does the media play on our emotions? Okay, to, uh, to act okay, in certain, uh, I don't know, situations. To help others, I'm not saying that. To vote. Help, to vote. I don't, I'm not saying that helping others, I mean, is wrong. Okay, because uh, we know that it is a good thing. But how how far okay uh, emotions lead us to act okay uh, in that particular situation again i'm not saying that this is wrong okay but just to help you understand that even if we are not ready to admit that we act on our emotions but deep down we know that many times not always but many times we act on our emotions would you sorry um, would you say that, uh, okay, so you said that emotions in, this, in the case of, for example, Socrates' condemnation was, um, you know... It played uh, a role, I don't know. Yeah, right. um, see, couldn't it simply be that, um, even in the case of Christ, um, the priority of where the, the, the reason was directed simply changed? Because reason has to have an objective, so when you make a rational choice, you, you have a starting point, you use reason to get to a conclusion. But we always assume that, um, or in the way what I'm listening to at least, there's the assumption that the reason has stayed the same and the emotion simply changed the trajectory. In reality, what could have happened simply was that the political situation changed in their minds, which means that a different rational choice was necessary. It does not necessarily mean that all of those were possessed by emotion. I mean, even even when we use psychologistic terms such as group think and whatever, um, on, on a very primal social evolutionary level, what we're dealing with there is a survival instinct of a social kind, and survival instinct is 
in many ways yes. rational. Yes. Yes. He is rational, you say? Highly rational. Yeah, but survival. But is it survival? Is very is it, is it he healthy to continue to speak I would about not agree, reason, completely agree with you. reason and emotions as if they were two things? Yes, yes. this is why. So it's, 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 it's the same thing. They are the same thing. Taken from a psychological the perspective, perspective and taken from a psychological perspective, um, thought creates emotions. Or uh, emotions and um, gut instinct um, then makes you think. But what I was actually at the end, what um, without going into the uh, debate of female or male, um, I think that at this moment in time, we are actually um, uh, turning the table here that instead of reason is controlling emotions, I think we're living in a time where we are saying thoughts are conditioning, reason conditions us, but if we live the moment and let our emotions from our senses, from our five senses, give us the information, then we will make an informed decision in the here and now and not conditioned by our thoughts, by our logic, but by our reasoning. So we need emotions because emotions keeps us alive in the sense that um, we get goose pimples as a reason of a strong emotion, whether it is fear or whether it is excitement. And they are the drivers for our actions. So what Aristotle said that um, reason is how we relate to the outside world, it is, this is the way, because emotions lead us to act, and we are, um, we are species that we avoid pain, and we go for pleasure, head on it, yeah, so, um, I think that there is actually a continuation, and from the history backwards till now, we are now in a position where we say, I mean, I am in this position at least, I would say, I say, I lived for many years uh, suppressing um, emotions in the sense that I don't want to be um, led. But on the other hand, I realized that I was led and conditioned by my own thoughts. Numbing emotion is only... And sometimes thoughts weren't mine, like you said, either media or my ancestors or my family or this or that. But if I live the moment through emotions, then I am not conditioned. And um, a philosopher, I ch just checked um, the name because I remember the surname, Ra Roll, and I forgot the name, Ro John Roll. He was, a, he was an American okay. um, philosopher. And uh, I always was fascinated by his concept of uh, Raoul's veil of ignorance, that to make ethical decisions, you need to have this veil in front of you. And... Um, um, but Mark thought, uh, said about even politics. To make any decision, you need to have this veil in front of you and you forget who you are. Whether I am female or male, whether I am colored or not. So any decision that I am going to make, I am not going to be influenced by who I am because obviously I will make decisions that will um, sort of um, uh, are positive only to me and to my race or to my whoever I am. So I think that reason and thoughts cannot be eliminated, cannot, but if they are conditioning. So just by living emotions, we can um, take away a bit of this conditioning. At least this is what I'm trying to... It can never be unconditioned. No, no, no. Before no. dying, at least. No, you cannot. But what I am saying is that thoughts. And what's so wrong about being conditioned after all? What I am saying, no, it will stop you from experiencing something fresh because you will have a preconceived idea. Yeah, yeah. So, what I am saying is that um, it will produce more of what I have. If I have a template inside, which is my thought. <coughs> I am going to go to Gozo, for example, with, with, this, with the thought that, ah, Gozo has fresher air, and I will enjoy it more. But if I am going to Gozo with the preconceived thought that in the week of Easter, it will be a nightmare. Jannata. So 
I will not go with the same Minyaf, you can see Pshtain, the park, Yam Minyaf, oh, sorry, um, uh, the, the restaurants, probably they will give me uh, bad stuff because they will be so understaffed, so many people. So, <laughs> you see, you see preconceived ideas. They yes. will create the experience. Mm -hmm. But you always have a template there of some kind. And they're yeah. useful. Yeah. They're different. Yes, yes. Cool. and they are. So that is what the, this is. The, the, this is in a way the paradox. Yeah, but basically what we're saying here is that the judgment to 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 deal with the pre is 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 is, is rational and emotional because you cannot separate but, the two. No. This 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 the cotton with this duality is is the most damaging I think. Uh, yes, because in epigenetics, uh, now the study is going through like what is also their, uh, how to say, experience, experience by our ancestors emotionally and it affects us emotionally without any thought. So uh, the instinct will be yes. just uh, triggered because of the experience of mm. our ancestry. Jung's collective so, unconscious. Collective Jung. Yes, I mean, those are factors which we cannot deny. Perhaps what we can say is that rationality and emotions are the two sides of the same coin. Because you cannot actually separate, I cannot be simply rational or exclusively rational, nor can I be simply or exclusively emotional, because one needs the other. If I am too rational, I mean, I become a robot. If I become too emotional, then obviously I might make hasty decisions, as you were saying, and uh, I can never actually be myself, my true self, because there is, there will be always emotions in control of me. So I think the usual balance, balance which is obviously not easy to, to achieve between rationality and emotionality. I would like to ask about emotional intelligence yes. within philosophy. Okay, yes, emotional intelligence uh, is another concept which um, uh, has been studied in these last decades um, because obviously, uh, again, intelligence has always been associated with rationality. Intelligence is a rational <coughs> aspect, is a rational process which obviously develops. Intelligence is something which we can measure. Intelligence quotient, IQ test, etc., etc. And again, emotionality was never thought of as being, uh, as coming into intelligence. And therefore, the idea of emotional intelligence um, is uh, important to, to understand intelligence in, in, in a full and complete way. So intelligence is not simply and exclusively something cognitive or something rational, but there is also emotional, uh, emotions coming. Uh, even I, one of the reasons which I mentioned at the beginning of my <coughs> uh, talk, uh, as for um, what reason is philosophy showing interest in emotions, was uh, philosophical aesthetics. And I told you that um, the idea of aesthetics brings into um, philosophy many important aspects of emotions. Uh, and not only aesthetics uh, is, let's say, affected by emotions, but also the way we come to learn things. And we know through, I mean, uh, those of you who teach and um, who have gone through um, <coughs> teaching program, we know how important emotion is in learning. If I am learning something against my will, if I am learning something which I consider to be boring, if I, I mean, I, am, I have to do, uh, I have to study a subject because it is compulsory, okay? How many students uh, hate systems of knowledge? Unfortunately. Even when someone doesn't learn because he doesn't like the teacher, or she's, Again, or she's ugly, yes, or yes, yes, it can be the subject, it can be the teacher, yes, of course. Uh, so, I mean, you have all the presuppositions for uh, not learning, or learning um, not in the, in the best possible way. So, the way I approach a subject, the way I present a subject, the way I think even the subject is all about, for example, uh, 
when uh, psychology was introduced as one of the intermediate subjects a couple of years ago. Okay, uh, there were literally thousands of students who were choosing psychology as one of the intermediate subjects in the matriculation certificate course. Why? Because obviously psychology is uh, the sort of subject of the moment. People think of becoming psychologists, obviously seeing television series, etc., uh, etc. Et okay, there was this huge, um, okay, <laughs> Um, bombardment on, on, on psychology. Why? Because obviously people have their idea of what psychology is, if it's interesting, uh, it will open many careers, etc. Uh, etc. Et so emotional intelligence uh, is important, especially also this has been seen in students with uh, a number of learning difficulties. The way material is presented, if material is presented in the usual classical way, or the traditional way, obviously, can become boring, even for the most intelligent students. But if you present material in, let's say, um, uh, a connected way, uh, in a pleasant way, in a way where students can um, participate, not only be on the listening side, then obviously uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, the ingredients are present for learning to take place, because. I am looking forward to learning something interesting, something which makes sense, especially uh, in my in my case. So yes, okay. obviously. Yes. Yes. Good. Uh, Max, can you imagine a hypothetical future world where states are governed by not human beings anymore, but by machines? Yes, by robots. Yes, by rational machines without any emotions, and even organizations. Um, where would that lead us? Yes, this is an aspect which unfortunately I did not hint at and I thank you Godwin for mentioning it. Uh, hopefully, I hope that time will not uh, come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, manufacturing them. And uh, yes, there, there are experiments, interesting experiments going on on whether robots can express emotions. Uh, I don't know whether you have seen some programs on on dry education, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where um, especially Japanese um, companies are working on robots, well, robots obviously have been with us for quite some time now, but the, uh, the new idea is, can a robot um, express emotions? Um, at school, um, they are already not here in Malta. There are some robots um, to teach languages because a robot um, will not uh, get angry mm -hmm. at the okay. students if he gets a wrong answer. A robot will not um, ridicule or even by facial expressions of what, of what they say. So with special needs, uh -huh. especially with special needs, they are putting robots. Um, mm -hmm. I, there still needs to be the human intervention yes. because it's the teacher at the back which needs to pro to yes with the laptop etc etc but um, uh, I was seeing a program where um, uh, students were in groups and each one had this robot mm. so uh, because I'm I'm talking about because it's funny yes about emotions how they control our think, our experience mm. so yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, today as you know as you might know I didn't know this but uh, there is also now uh, a special um, uh, a specialization of ethics which is called robot ethics. I was listening to the BBC uh, between 2 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Classic FM. There, are, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is a very interesting program in which they take different topics and they interview specialists in the subject and I was listening to the idea of, uh, there is a professor uh, in England, I don't remember the university, um, who uh, teaches robot ethics. That is, okay, what is the ethics, what are the ethical implications of robots? Godwin mentioned, for example, <coughs> can the day arrive when we will be governed by robots? We already have robots in many factories and this has already uh, brought up certain problems, for example, redundancies, because obviously what a robot can do cannot be 
compared with what human beings, because human beings have to rest. Okay, uh, they have um, a working week for the other or whatever. And robots, obviously, uh, okay, can overcome those limitations. So, uh, yes, I, I didn't know that this was something which is now being taught at universities, robotics. <laughs> What uh, Godwin mentioned about about having politicians uh, who robot who politicians. are uh, robotic yeah. politicians because <laughs> 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 there is the aspect mm -hmm. of rhetoric, for example, which also there is, reference to? There, there is the aspect of rhetoric, which also okay. deals a lot yes. with ab about yes. Uh, yes, about emotion. Rhetoric is um, emotion. <laughs> Can a robot be bribed? They don't right. necessarily have to be robots as we imagine them. They yes, can yes, be yes, like yes. a super uh, computer. Big brother. Yes, they can decisions. <laughs> so should emotions be something part of the curriculum of students at primary at the primary schools? That is be one of the subjects basically. Yes. Um, if you control emotions, you have the extra intelligence or the extra advantage more than the intelligence. Then, uh, then someone who is studying, for example, if you are bright in maths, mm -hmm. but you are not able of expressing yourself. Yes. So, if you have a person who is able to express himself mm -hmm. and has this much of a knowledge, while someone who has this much of a knowledge but not able of expressing himself, mm -hmm. he he is an as an advantage. Yes, yes. <coughs> I, to my to my knowledge, here in Malta, I don't. Think think that there is, I think, neither in private schools, uh, emotional education, but uh, this topic comes in uh, in the subject of PSD, yes. Person and Social De Development, or PSDE, it's called I think now, Person and Social Development Education. Uh, I, the, the topic of emotions is dealt with. Obviously, it depends on how many lessons are attributed, uh, are dedicated to the subject, um, but PSD, as you know, now is not only present in secondary schools, but it is also present in primary schools. It's also so in MCAS, even at higher levels, yes. even at MCAS. Right. Um, okay. It's called social and individual, um, oh yes, sorry, um, individual and social responsibility. So, all right, okay. And uh, the, uh, it's at level two, at level three, at level four, and um, it was at level five. Um, right. But now the program has changed because before it was VTech, but okay. now it's an um, ingrown program. But right. so it's throughout now. Okay. It's throughout. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I stand to be corrected. Uh, in the subject which has been introduced. Um, uh, quite recently, in ethics. You know that there is ethics now in schools, both in primary and in secondary schools, which is which has been introduced uh, as an alternative, in a way, to those who do not choose religious education, <coughs> religious knowledge. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, 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 question, the topic of emotions is treated also in, in this subject. So there is... Um, Okay, um, emotional education, okay, not as a subject on its own, but as part of other subjects. And I think that this is important, as you are saying, because uh, children have to learn how to express emotions. And I think um, this might seem to be a contradiction in, uh, in this day and age. I mean, we have a lot of problems with emotions. So how come children bully other children? Children who, I mean, uh, render the life of their classmates, okay, uh, hell, um, through various um, actions which show, okay, this uh, idea of, okay, I show that I am strong, that I am um, a bully, okay, I am uh, stronger than you, you are weaker. So, <laughs> there is this contradiction almost, okay? Uh, we are coming to understand more and more the importance of emotions. At the same time, there is this, I mean, diffusion, I would say, of bullying, uh, but not only more, I mean, 
in Italy, Buddhismo, and in England. I mean, I think you heard about uh, the student who was killed I mean, yeah. yesterday or the day, the day before. Uh, and in the news, it was uh, Londra uh, Pew. Londra Pew. Londra Pew. Pericolosa. Ecco. Thank you. Londra Pew, Pericolosa di New York. Sorry. Okay, so um, this is, in a way, a contradiction. Okay, uh, we should become more tolerant, okay, and do all the speech which we hear of tolerance, of um, acceptance, of solidarity. Okay, on the other hand, we have all these examples of, okay, um, non tolerance of. Uh, this hatred, homo homophobia, misogyny, the cases of uh, feminicide, of women being killed by either their partners or their husbands. Okay. So, um, what is your view on meditation when it comes to the on meditation? When it comes to meditation. The, when it comes to being with the more meditation. 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 <laughs> meditation. Well, I think uh, meditation is various forms. Obviously, there are various forms of meditation. Right. Um, can help, I'm sure, to become conscious of your emotions, of controlling your emotions. I mean, for example, Buddhism uh, has a very important uh, aspect in this regard. Meditation, through meditation, I come to know better myself and better able to understand myself and to understand my actions and my emotions. So, yes, of course, meditation. But I think a lot of emotions are expressed through the ego. Um, not only, eh? not only through the ego, but also through the unconscious. A very, very good movie, it's animation, um, about emotion, is Inside Out. Um, it's actually, um, it's a, a cartoon, but a very, very, very interesting cartoon, which depicts how our emotions um, dictate what we do. Mm -hmm. And what happens to the body, a good, a good um, feeling, a good thought, a bad thought, then it is manif um, manifested outside. It's, uh, even for children, that's why it's with... Uh, Can I say something on what you said about robots? You were speaking about ro no, about, about right. training right. Right. Emotions. Education, emotion, emotion. But I wanted to uh, link it to the robots. Because the day might come when robots will create better humans because a robot is a wired thing and it's 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 becoming uh, so so um, sophisticated and so superior as a as a working machine that the day may come when the robots will be able to mend the defective machine which is us because our we are wired, our emotions, education of emotions begins from day one. No? And, and the problem is why, I, why I, I, I flare up or I, I, I love too much or I hate too much or, is because I'm badly wired. And you cannot, re it's very difficult to reverse this. But the day may come, hopefully, that robots will be able to mend us. And make them like them, but like them, not like them, um, like them. Um, so they, the day may come, I, I suppose, when robots can be able to make a better humanity, better human beings, better wired people. Without emotions. Um, create a similar. No emotions. Just a second. Just, just to say, um, emotions which are better wired to speak like that. Better wired emotions, because emotions will always be there in us, but we are badly wired because our mothers, fathers and whatever uh, have just... I didn't... Yes, it's true, but if we're all wired the same way. Yeah. Not all the same way, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Intelligent wiring will... will um, will, 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 will... But you need a robot to do that, you can do it by yourself. Sorry? Oh, it's clear that we can't. Uh, well, we can in a, in a certain way, but actually we, what we can do is to dominate our 
bad wiring, uh, control our bad wiring, but we never actually um, change the wiring that was installed from day one till the fifth year. We never do that. We can control it because we can we can really control it. But but I think the day because he said. God forbid the day will come, but I think the day will come and will go over when robots will in fact perfect humanity. And who will have perfected the robot to do that? We have. So you are in perfect control and able to do that? Yes, yes, why not? Yes, 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 why not? Why not? Why not? But we are, we are creating something that can make us better, in fact. But you can use reason to use maths to create a thing which actually can be fixed. So you say our emotions are fixed. You can control your thoughts. You control your thoughts. Because the robot will be the guardian. Who will start over? Yes. You are a human. It's a certain intelligence. That is coming from. Where? Yes, an intelligence yeah. that is wired, yeah. that is it's so perfectly wired. By who? By who? But how can? Hello, emotionless. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> how how can an emotion an emotionless machine um, put? Put uh, in the right way, emotion. Yeah, it can, it can, because AI. because it can be wired in such a you way can, as you if, can if you have, to of course, emotions. if you have this, you will do this, this, and if it's not this, minus this. So would be like having robots with emotions. Simulated. The difference is that emotions. Robots will have simulated emotions, but as you will have natural emotions. Possible. Dr. Kassar, on this uh, topic, I think this is like replicating Bowlby's experiment with the primates. Mm -hmm. I mean, when mm -hmm. there is mechanical care, which uh, can never replace uh, the attachment mm -hmm. process yes, that can. happens with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the, mam the mammalian bonding. bonding. Yes, the experiment which he had carried out mm -hmm. when he took a small chimpanzee and he put it uh, near a uh, model of its mother um, which was wired and which was, I think it had some fluff one with it's wired. It's wired. It's on YouTube. I have it. Um, the original experiment. Yes, yes, yes. If you look it, if you look it up, it's on YouTube. Yes, yes. Uh, it? yes. Uh, and uh, the, the, the monkey the monkey chimpanzee um, showed uh, pr uh, mental problems. It showed uh, behavioral problems. Obviously. We already have that. <coughs> so it's. Uh, but they were not able to succeed. We already have that. All of us. Will you conclude? <laughs> <laughs> I was cuddled and fed by my mother, not by a machine. <laughs> God gave her eternal rest. So, okay. Um, all right. So, I think uh, we can close here today. Thank you for your Thank you. participation.